Well, welcome everybody to the League of Women Voters meeting for this month of March. I just want to remind you that you should have gotten from the Georgia League the invitation to the annual convention in May. And please remember that everybody is encouraged to attend. It will be by Zoom. So go ahead and sign yourselves in. Jennifer and I are the two official voting delegates, but the rest of you certainly can join in and help us remember everything that we've heard during the convention. We will probably need that. Tonight, we are delighted to have Dr. Bush with us, and I'm going to call on Rosemary to introduce him. Yes, I have a little bit of information about David. David graduated from the State University of New York and then went to Duke for his master's degree. Uh, he worked as a geophysicist for Pennzoil in the U.S. Offshore International Division for six years before returning to Duke for his Ph.D. And he also worked for a couple of years with the U.S. Geological Survey Marine Biology Branch. Uh, David came to West Georgia in 1995 and has been here since then. In 2018, he took over the editorship uh, from a Duke professor of Southern Geology. And he has published many articles and books and also spoke to our own League of Women Voters in March of 2012. Uh, tonight, he will speak about climate in crisis. David, it's up to you. Hi there. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me again. Uh, I always enjoy uh, giving a talk and listening to myself. So uh, this is kind of interesting to do these things on Zoom. I try to do it every now and then. Uh, I've tried these and um, I haven't, uh, haven't had much success because of the, the sharing of the screen. But fortunately, we just finally got high speed internet out in our area. And so you all are the first ones I'm gonna be able to actually do a PowerPoint presentation from home on. Normally I'd have to go into my office to do it. So this is very, uh, very good for me. Uh, I appreciate the chance to talk about um, climate change. You know, it's a, it's a, a hot topic. It's been a hot topic for decades. I wonder a lot why, uh, why we don't have more of a consensus I think we have a lot of anti-science sentiment around the country. And uh, I just want to spend a little bit of time today showing you some about where we stand uh, in terms of our climate, what's happening, and maybe what we can do about it. So if I can start my presentation here, uh, what did, uh, uh, now something different is happening here. Oh, there it is, okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, does this work? All right, there we go. Y'all can see that climate in crisis, okay? Yes. Well, yes. Uh, I wanted to, uh, when I first started thinking about giving a, a presentation on climate and uh, the climate in crisis and I wanted to come up with some kind of phrase that would uh, grab people's attention. Climate and crisis was kind of neat, but how do you begin to talk? It's such a big, big topic. So I, I happened to come across this book. I heard a, I heard a guy, being in the, the author being interviewed on NPR, and the very first uh, sentence of his book is this. The name of the book is, uh, uh, the, the, the uninhabitable earth, but the, the first sentence is it is worse, much worse than you think. And this book here, The Uninhabitable Earth, you may have heard of David Wallace Wells. He's on TV quite a bit and written other things. And, and he, uh, it's a really well-written book and it's frightening. I mean, if you, if you like to be scared, 
like watching, uh, uh, you know, Hitchcock movies or the horror fests or Stephen King novels and things. Well, get this book and read this and, and you'll be uh, uh, terrified. It's really well referenced. It, it, it's an easy read. There's a lot of information, but it's, it's well presented. Uh, so one of the things, I, I'm going to jump around to a few things, but what's going on with the climate? We want to set the stage, see where things are. And one, one thing you can look at, this is a NASA diagram, of what's, what's going on with the climate as far as temperature goes in the last 50 years. And you can see, this is uh, by the colors, parts of the globe have gotten a little cooler, but most of it has gotten warmer. And this uh, shows over the last 50 years compared to a, an average, uh, the baseline it's called 1951 to 1980, you can see how much warmer the globe has gotten. Now you'll notice that it's warmer in the Arctic. That's the warmest part. And that's because a lot of that in the Northern hemisphere, uh, a lot of it is feedback loops from melting of uh, sea ice. As you move, sea, melt sea ice, you remove white cover from the Earth's surface and replace it with dark color. And the dark color can absorb more heat. And then that just creates more of a feedback. You notice off of uh, the southern tip of Greenland and, and uh, there around uh, Antarctica, the blue where it's gotten colder, that's because of melting of the glaciers, of course, and runoff. So the Earth has gotten warmer. Uh, there's no question about that. And we see a lot of other things in general observations. These maps notice the direction of the arrows. Seems like ocean heat content has increased, sea level has increased, snow cover has decreased, sea surface temperatures increased, sea ice area has decreased. And one of the big things is water vapor has increased. As we increase temperature, we evaporate more water from the ocean and from land and put it into the atmosphere. And so you have more uh, heat and more water vapor that have the potential for more floods, more rainstorms, uh, more energy in the atmosphere means bigger storms, bigger hurricanes, stronger hurricanes, all this crazy winter weather we've had, that's a lot, that's due to uh, uh, more, more vapor in the atmosphere as well. Another interesting observation was made last year, just a little over a year ago, in Antarctica, way down in this little peninsula down, down here, recorded the highest temperature ever recorded in Antarctica. It got to 65 degrees. And so uh, just another example of a measurement that we've got that, that things are warming around the globe. The author of that book, David Wallace Wells, uh, that I mentioned, uh, I like this, this sentence. He said that no human has ever lived on a planet as hot as this one. One of the, the themes of, of this topic is that we know and we hear often that temperature has been higher in the past, in the geologic past, temperature of Earth has been colder in the past. When we talk about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, people say, well, you know, it's, it's been higher in the past, so, you know, what's, what's the deal now? Why is now uh, rising carbon, uh, carbon dioxide level? Why is it a big deal now? And it wasn't in the past. Well, the deal is there weren't people in the past. So when people were, since people have been around, we're getting warmer and warmer and warmer, the warmest that Earth has ever been since the time people evolved. So it doesn't matter what happened 600,000 years ago or 10 million years ago or 200 million years ago, it doesn't affect us. And, and things are changing at a rate now that's much faster than how things uh, changed in the past. So the entire globe is heating up and this is no surprise. Scientists back 200 years ago started to realize that the atmosphere, different gases in the atmosphere could, could heat the planet. And just having an atmosphere means the, the planet could warm over time. 
the uh, decades now, more than 60 years ago, we started measuring the atmosphere enough that we could see increase in carbon dioxide and increase in temperature. And we started to get warnings. And, and for the last 30 years, at least, we've had dire warnings of what's going to happen. 30 years ago was about when Al Gore uh, published, uh, what was the book, the, the, the Earth and Balance or what, whatever it was, and Inconvenient Truth. A lot of people say, well, you know, changes in temperature probably just due to changes in solar radiation, incoming solar radiation. And there are changes in solar radiation. But if you look at this graph, the yellow line is average uh, solar irradiance or insulation. And it goes up and down, up and down, but it's relatively constant. Whereas the red line, the temperature, has really started to increase over the last uh, 60 years or so. So yes, changes in, in uh, solar irradiance can occur and can warm the planet a little bit, a little bit. More of the warming has to be due to something besides solar, incoming solar energy. A big breakthrough came in the late 50s when uh, Charles David Keeling was measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere on Hawaii and uh, noticed this steady increase. You see this curve going on. The zigzag motion is due to se seasonal changes. And they could correlate this increase in carbon dioxide concentration with increase in global uh, temperature. And uh, these are some uh, diagrams from various places. Mostly I got from uh, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But you notice the, uh, the, top, the top graph is just temperature anomaly over the last hundred and so years and a couple hundred years. And you can see how it started to go up around 1900. And the same with the bottom graph, which is sea level. And it's been going up since about the 1900s. And, and we have other da data that goes uh, further into the, into the past. Here's a couple other graphs. Uh, Car, uh, concentration, the upper graph, con concentration of different uh, gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and, and uh, the, bottom, the bottom graph shows global human sourced carbon dioxide. And notice this, notice we have two main sources in this simple diagram. It's uh, forestry and other land use and fossil fuels, cement production and use and flaring. Flaring is burning off of natural gas. There's always natural gas that comes out of oil wells. Some wells are just natural gas wells. There's no oil in them, but oil wells also have natural gas. And if there's not that much of it in there, it's not profitable. It's not economically feasible to collect that uh, methane and uh, sell it. So they just burn it off. And that's what flaring is, but it adds a lot of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And it can add methane straight to the atmosphere too, which is a, an intense uh, uh, greenhouse gas. So notice uh, the, the, the rates of, or the amounts of uh, material that's being added. Started, starting uh, you know, 100 years ago or so, the amount of fossil fuels uh, cement and flaring added to the, the atmosphere has, has been going up exponentially. It's a huge amount. And uh, so much of that has happened uh, since post-1950. So it's really gotten more and more. Uh, David Wallace Wells compares uh, a lot of this stuff to the 30-year mortgage. And you often hear that uh, compared to it because, um, you know, that's something that we can all picture. You know, most people bought a house, they're, they're in, they're, they look at things in a 30-year time frame. A lot of these projections of what's going to happen with temperature and sea level rise, are, uh, you often see them on a 30-year time frame because of that. But it fits in really interesting here because 
in 1992, so we're talking you know, 30 years ago, basically, uh, the United Nations uh, really began their thing, which ultimately led to the Paris Accords that I'm sure you've heard of, been in the news the last several years, especially. And also in 92, Al Gore uh, published his Earth in the Balance. So you know, we don't have any excuses post-1992 to not know what's been going on with climate, with carbon dioxide concentrations. And the, the summary sentence uh, uh, that Wallace Wells uses is that we have done as much damage since Al Gore published his book as was done in all of, of all in all of history before that. We did things without knowing it for hundreds of years, thousands of years, really. Uh, but since we've known of it, since 1992, uh, we have now engineered as much ruin knowingly as we ever managed in in uh, in ignorance, and that's kind of you know kind of an interesting thing to think about. So we don't really have much excuse. There, there's a lot of carbon dioxide being put into the atmosphere. Uh, the United States is not the biggest uh, contributor. China is, and uh, we have uh, been working on ways to reduce the amount of uh, carbon footprint that we have. We've made some strides because of efficiency of use of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fuel efficiency and things like that and, and new techniques, but there's a lot of things we aren't doing. China and India, India is a small contributor relatively right now, but it's going to be huger and huger as they develop. And there's a lot of China that's being developed. And of course, a lot of the, the lesser developed parts of the world are going to be uh, having more and more carbon uh, footprint. Uh, this is something that ties into the Keeling curve, the car carbon dioxide concentration versus time. And you see this goes back over 800,000 years. And you notice the, ch the changes. But, but look at this way up in the upper right hand corner. And you can see where I put this red arrow this basically a vertical straight line. That's what's been going on in the last 50 to 100 years or so. And the Keeling curve uh, uh, records in Mauna Loa in Hawaii it went back to 1958. So it's been, since then that we've had absolute uh, record of, of instrumentation. Before that, we've done uh, sampling of air bubbles trapped in ice cores, but we've got a really good record and it's really uh, reliable. If we kind of zoom in on the last couple hundred years, you notice just how steep that curve has gotten. And we have been putting more and more, and uh, people who have been studying this thing say that we need to stop at about 350 parts per, per million of concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in order to keep the climate from not going haywire. Well, you, you can see that we've blown way past uh, 350. We're up past four, oh, 420 or so now. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of mass extinctions. we we'll bring this in because there have been five mass extinctions throughout uh, the last five, 600 million years. And all of them have had some big component uh, of climate change. Of course, they weren't human induced, but they were changes in plate tectonics that changed the amount of land area that we've had or elevations and changed erosion, changed the amount of land that's in the poles or in the tropics and doing all kinds of things and evolution of plants and and what have you, it really changed a lot of things, volcanic eruptions, uh, periods of huge volcanic eruptions. So a lot of those mass extinctions have some kind of uh, climate component. The thing that's happening now and why a lot of geologists think that we're going into a sixth mass extinction is because what we're doing to the climate, we're making uh, the climate change faster and we're adding carbon to the atmosphere at least 10 times faster 
than the natural processes uh, that caused those previous extinctions. And just, just to go back to that for a second, we've all heard about the giant asteroid that hit, uh, that killed the dinosaur 65 million years ago, and it did. But there was also a climate component that was underway before that, and that's pretty much been positively proven. Uh, uh, so even though we, we still say that the, the asteroid killed the dinosaurs, let's just say it finished them off. They were already, there already was change of foot. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're now putting in carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at least 10 times faster than natural processes and 100 times faster than were being done before the Industrial Revolution. So it's possible we're on our way to a mass extinction, a sixth one. And one of the things that warming of the planet does, it, it forces species to migrate. They want to stay in the same temperature. So tropical species would migrate poleward. And the change, even though it's happened in the past, it's happening faster now, and the plants and animals can't keep up with the rapid change. They can't migrate as fast. They can't evolve as fast. And that's one of the big reasons we have extinction of animals and plants. Things are just happening too fast. There's also geopolitical reasons uh, that this is going to be a problem in the future because, you know, our, for example, here in the United States, our uh, breadbasket of the country, the wheat belt and the corn belt, all that perfect climate in the central part of the country for growing wheat and growing corn, that's migrating to the north. And Canada has the same kind of breadbasket it's migrating to the north, and it's going to migrate out of, north, of the United States and wholly into Canada, you know, if it keeps going. So because they, the, the, the uh, national boundaries don't migrate, of course, it just the climate does, that's going to move the good crop growing areas out of one country into another or move drought areas from one country into another. So there's that kind of that kind of uh, ramification as well. Uh, I wanna just say a little bit about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the world's authority on uh, what's going on with the, with the climate. And it's with the uh, formed by the United Nations and the World uh, Meteorological so, uh, uh, Organization. And basically all the countries in the world contribute to it. They don't do their original research, but they have thousands of people working and they're reviewing all kinds of uh, scientific research. And they're making all kinds of predictions on what might happen and, and putting out all kinds of reports. And there's a new report coming out this year and next year. It comes out in pieces over the years. It's gonna tell us uh, the, the latest update, it's been seven or eight years since the last one, the newest updates on what's happening, the newest projections for sea level rise and temperature changes and things like that. And, and what, what they really want to lock into is you know, they want to make predictions, but some of the big complexity is what is it that people are going to do? We don't, we don't know. That's the big uh, factor. We can put all kinds of information into the models that the IPCC is going to then use to make recommendations, but they can't predict exactly how people are going to behave. Are we going to become more efficient? Are we going to produce less greenhouse gases? <clears throat> Plus climate, uh, just the, the processes are very, uh, very complex. So there's a lot of unknowns. But what people are going to do is the big problem. Here's some uh, projections of what's going to happen that, uh, with, uh, with changes in, in temperatures and uh, by, uh, by, uh, uh, in the summer and in the, and in the winter. Uh, just there's, there's tons of these kinds of maps, and you can see where there's going to be more uh, uh, rain in different parts of the of the globe, and 
where it's going to be drier and, and, and where it's going to be wetter. And look what's happening to uh, <clears throat> Australia, to uh, Northern Africa and, and Europe and Southern Europe. And uh, there's going to be places that are going to be really dry. There's going to be a lot of droughts. There's going to be a lot of wars fought over water in the future. Here's some temperature, uh, predicted temperature changes. Uh, and look, 100 year, tw 20 years from now, uh, and a hundred years from now, the the increase in temperature, and uh, it's 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 going to be there are going to be parts of the planet that are uninhabitable, basically by today's standards. Part of the deal about the the Paris Accords and why they were so important and why it's good that the U.S. is going to get back into it is that the IPCC uh, kind of came to the conclusion that uh, at first we were going to try to have a global agreement to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius. And then they decided by looking at things again that we should really shoot to 1.5 because we were already about 1.5 that we really needed to stop it now. And the, the latest report from IPCC has, has these graphs in it that show the difference between what might happen to temperature and, and precipitation, the difference between if we warm to two degrees versus only warming to 1.5 degrees. And that's what these graphs are, these maps. They show the top one, the, temp, the, the difference in the hottest days of the year uh, between warming globally to two degrees versus 1.5. And there's a lot of warmer days, a lot more warmer days if we get to two versus 1.5. And then the temperature, the second one is the temperature of the coldest nights. And that's the real big difference. It's going to be much warmer during colder, the coldest nights of the year than it is now. And much warmer, just stopping that warming at 1.5 degrees above what it is today versus two degrees is going to make a big difference. And then uh, precipitation on the bottom is going to, uh, if we could stop it at 1.5 versus going ahead to two degrees, it's going to uh, save us a lot of change in, in precipitation. So there's a, there's a lot of complexity in these things and, and uh, I don't wanna get into it in, in great detail, but it, it's kind of neat if you ever get a chance, just search for IPCC and look for some of the reports. And uh, you get to look at those graphs and study them in detail. As part of the problems that we're going to see if, if global temperatures keep going to two degrees and three or four plus five degrees over the next century, the biggest thing is heat. We hear a lot about temperature, I mean, uh, hurricanes, and, and we hear a lot of temperature, seawater, and you know, just global atmospheric temperature, and, and more storms and more floods, but just regular old heat, summer heat, is the biggest killer in the world. Kills more than floods, kills more than hurricanes. And if we don't stop something, we're going to, have these kinds of, of effects, uh, the, the, the warmest summers, warmer summers, more heat waves, more cities that have average maximum, maximum summertime temperatures of, of 95 degrees. It's just going to be miserable. There really are predictions that there are going to be great areas of the tropics that are simply uninhabitable by human beings if we get to something like plus five degrees global warming. Another thing I mentioned a little bit about crops, but here's some information from these uh, reports that every degree of warming, you decrease yields and cereal crops by 10%. But not only do you decrease the yield, there's studies that show that for example, rice contains less protein as the temperature increases. So not only do you have a decrease in the amount of protein, in, I mean, uh, the amount of these cereal grains, uh, the productivity of the, of the crops, 
but decrease in the protein content. And by 2100, we're going to have 50% more people on the planet and 50% less grain because of increase in temperature. So we've got we've got a lot of problems. And, and notice the, the final thing there is that the natural wheat belt is moving poleward in, in, by 160 miles every 10 years. So you can just you know, think about that as we uh, look forward to what's going on in the next century. Sea level rise, coastal flooding, along with this, of course, is uh, more storms and, and what have you. But so much of the world's population lives near the coast, and there's going to be more and more uh, damage and displacement of people, big impacts on coastal areas. Every year, the average American emits enough carbon dioxide to melt uh, uh, 10,000 tons of ice. And for to be able to picture that in your mind, one cubic meter, one cubic yard is about one ton, uh, weighs about one ton. So we're talking about 10,000 cubic meters of, of ice, which is basically 10,000 uh, cubic meters of water. And that's enough to fill four Olympic sized swimming pools. So we each do that, not personally, but all the, the, pro, pro, the uh, businesses and industry uh, for each person in the, in the United States contributes that much to global warm or to uh, warming the temperature. River flooding is gonna increase as I mentioned before, more evaporation, more warming in the atmosphere means more flooding. Uh, the the so-called sunny day flooding is going to increase as sea level rises. This is the flooding where just because of sea, sea, sea level rise, we're gonna get more uh, during the spring tides, uh, high tides at full moons and new moons are gonna cause more flooding that's not associated with storms. That's why it's called the sunny day flooding. And uh, you can see the increase in sunny day flooding. This is Port, uh, uh, Fort Pulaski here uh, near Tybee Island. Just in the, the last several years, the last few decades, how the increase in the number of events of sunny day flooding has, has, uh, has risen. Uh, so we're going to have to do something to, to deal with that. We have to elevate roadways. You know, if you, if you go out on the, what is that highway? Is that the 78 or whatever it is that goes out to uh, Tybee Island? Now I'm spacing out and don't remember the, the number of the highway. Wildfires are a big thing. We hear that in the evening news. The last year there was huge wildfires out in California huge wildfires in Australia. Uh, one interesting thing uh, in California, where they had these big wildfires, one big wildfire can strip away all the gains that have made by uh, environmental policy. So all the saving of carbon dioxide by doing all the good things, all wiped out by one fire. Not only are there wildfires in Western US and in Australia, but even in the uh, Scandinavian countries, above the Arctic Circle, there have been wildfires. And that adds a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And of course, the other thing it does is it destabilizes the, the soils, don't have the vegetation to slow down the, the flowing of water on the, on the surface of the land. And so there's more erosion, more runoff, more landslides, so big feedback loops. The Australian fires, uh, the, there's, there's been a big drought in Australia and there were a tremendous amount of fires. We saw them all over the news last year. And you may have heard on the, I remember seeing on the evening news, a billion animals killed. And those are uh, real animals. At first, when I heard that, I thought, well, you know, that's not so bad if 999 million of those are mosquitoes, but it's not. They're real, real animals like mammals and birds and reptiles. 
So uh, it, it's a, it's an amazing number, and it's probably the, the people who study this stuff say it's probably many times more than just one billion. Uh, th this is a heat map, as it's called. Of notice what we've got on the x-axis here. It's just years from 1910 to uh, 2020, and the vertical axis is is uh, the seasons, the the months. And you just notice as we've gone uh, from 1910 to 2020, we're starting to see it a lot warmer temperatures even in the winter, which would be our summer, of course. And uh, this is uh, for Australia. So I, I love this. I think this would make a nice wall hanging. But it shows how we've got more and more months of the year where it's warmer and warmer and warmer. It's easy to really visualize in one glance. The uh, so-called unnatural disasters, more of these storms, these odd storms, the winter storms that have been going across the country this, the, just in the past few weeks, and the ice storms that we all had, and Texas had all that problem, Mississippi had all those problems. Again, that's because of all this moisture put into the atmosphere, giving more uh, source for snow and, and, and uh, rainfalls and intense storms intense uh, hurricanes as well as intense uh, winter storms. Uh, and the, the idea that every time you see a snowstorm, for example, or an individual storm, you can't really say that any single particular uh, storm was caused by global warming. But we do know that global warming causes more and more storms and uh, more and more of these extreme events. So the, as global warming continues, we can expect to see more and more extreme events. A hurricane Harvey, you remember that a few years ago? And it was actually tropical storm Harvey at the end, uh, brought all that rain to Houston area. Uh, you've heard of the 100 year flood. The, the, we, we have more than one 100-year uh, flood each year, but it means statistically a rainfall or, or um, flood elevation, uh, elevation of the flood in a river that has statistically a 1% chance of occurring each year. Harvey caused flooding that was one in 500,000 years chance of occurring. So whatever that is, 0.0001% or 2% uh, that comes out to, but instead of one in a hundred year flood, that was a one in 500,000 year flood. So it was really huge. Some other things that we've noticed with the changes in ex uh, climate extremes, we expect to see more and more of these things, heavy precipitation, more droughts, more uh, uh, hot days and hot nights, more heat waves, stronger tropical storms, tropical cyclones, more droughts, fewer cold days and fewer cold nights. It's going to be miserable. This is a good time uh, uh, to just think of what, what our grandchildren are going to, going to have to deal with and our great-grandchildren if, uh, if we don't reverse this. And in, and in fact, things have gone to the point now uh, the, a lot of climate scientists say that, you know, we're, we're beyond stopping this. Now we're at a point where we need to try to limit the damage and really stay, if we can stop everything and stay to this only 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming, uh, that, that's what we really need to do. And, but the changes that we've already set in motion are going to continue for hundreds of years. It's not something we can turn around in time for our grandchildren to know how cool things were, relatively cool. Uh, back when I was a kid, you know, I, I've seen the warming. Uh, we all have over our lifetimes. Well, we, we've gone beyond that. Our grandchildren, even great-grandchildren, aren't going to go back to that. It's going to be hundreds of years or a thousand years uh, before we get back to that point. I'll talk about that a little bit more later on what we can do. And fresh water is going to be the problem because of more evaporation. So water is just going to evaporate faster. 
there's going to be growing population, more demand. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of research that shows that or that predicts that the next great wars are going to be fought over water. And, um, you know, it's hard not to believe that. Uh, you've heard about uh, sea level rising and the seas, the oceans warming. One of the things ocean warming does, adding carbon dioxide in there, it uh, causes the water to become more acidic and it actually dissolves the calcium carbonate shells of the critters living in there. And a lot of the things that are living in there that have shells of calcium carbonate are plants that produce 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. So, and of course, coral bleaching and things like that. Uh, there, there are little plants that live in the coral membranes that help the coral to uh, calcify, to build their framework. And the global warming is hurting the, the, those plants too and the acidification is, is hurting them. So we're, we're having a lot of problems with just the stuff growing in the, growing in the ocean that we need for producing oxygen and for also producing food. And there are more and more diseases that are spreading because of global warming. One, that idea of displacing things as warmer temperatures displace things poleward and also vertically up mountains, it makes good habitat for mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, the warmer things are, they love to live there. And you can see that here, you've heard about warnings of different kinds of food, the Zika virus, dengue fever. We're starting to get uh, things migrating like fire ants and now murder hornets and, and all that, they, 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 can, they can live in more and more parts of the world because the temperature is getting warmer. And also deforestation helps to spread, spread these things around too. So deforestation in the Amazon, for example, uh, you remove a, a square a mile of forest and you have more area for people to live and more area for the mosquitoes to live more area that's going to warm and more people come in contact. And there's actually something like, uh, yeah, I forget the number, but for every square mile of forest that's removed, there's X number of more cases of malaria in the Amazon than there were before. And uh, wars, there's just going to be more conflict. There's, there's research uh, that suggests psychological sociology research that suggests just the warmer temperatures make people act crazier and increase the potential for conflict. But also when you add in the, the, the fight for water and other resources that, uh, that uh, can increase the potential for, for uh, wars. Sea level rise, NASA, if you ever watched the, the NASA channel, they had a little, uh, and this is for military, but NASA had the NASA channel has a little uh, 15 or 20 minute video about how sea level rise is affecting all the NASA, you know, the, the uh, space launch buildings and all their ships and all their other stuff that they that they have. But a lot of our military infrastructure, especially for the Navy, uh, is in jeopardy because of sea level rise. And in, here in Norfolk, where we have so much uh, uh, naval uh, infrastructure, they've actually had to elevate some of these big piers that they dock the ships at. So <laughs> because they were getting too low for the ships to dock at them. And so th th there's a lot of crazy stuff going on there. And, and of course, as sea level rises and you start to flood the land, then you have, uh, in this case, for example, military land is going to disappear because it's flooded, but maybe because of private development around it, no new area for them to expand into without uh, buying people off their property or moving people off their property. So there's a lot of, lot of problems to it. And uh, James Hansen, you may have heard that name. He was a NASA scientist who uh, basically uh, 
quit NASA when he was forced to to not publish some of his in, information. He's he's one of the big names now in uh, making projections on what's going to happen. And if you think about the development of human civilization, even going back thousands of years, that's what's reflected in this statement. Our, our modern civilizations and societies around the world evolved in a climate that no longer exists. So all the things that we do and how our bodies have evolved too um, are not really adapted for the temperatures that are to come. And that's why it's, it's said that there are going to be parts of the tropics uh, that are so hot and so humid that will be so hot and so humid given a certain amount of, sea, of uh, global temperature increase that people aren't going to be able to live there. The human animal uh, is just not adaptable to living in those uh, climates or what might be that climate. Just the pure uh, humidity and heat. So we asked the question, so it's a whole mess. It is worse, much worse than we, than we thought. Uh, how do we get into this mess? And there's just so many reasons. Uh, we, we, we tend to put things off, you know, that are down the road. Uh, we didn't see things happening at quite the rate they're happening now. Now we can see it. And so these are just some of the reasons. It won't affect me, it won't be that bad. It's a hoax, we'll adapt. One of the big things is we always think there'll be a technological fix, that we're smart enough to have some new technology. And there's actually a lot of truth to that. Uh, Geoengineering, it's called. And, and there are a lot of things we can do. And I'm going to show you a few of them. But we're also going to have to make a lot of changes in, in our behavior. So we don't want to, even though things are a mess and much worse than we thought, <laughs> than you probably think. We don't want to give up because there are a lot of things we can do. We, we know the science, we know the engineering, but it's really a human problem. We've made this mess in great measure, even though earth was warming before people came along. We've, it's been uh, 12,000 years or so since the last uh, great ice age. We didn't have the technology for the first 10,000 of those years since then, or 11,000 really. It wasn't the population to have much impact. 12,000 year ago, years ago was the last great ice age. And we just started warming since then, a natural process. What we've done though in the last thousand years and especially the last 200 years and especially the last 50 years is just increase the rate through industrialization, increase the rate of pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We've done it and we can actually fix it. You need to know where the carbon dioxide or all greenhouse gases uh, come from, the, the, what different sectors of, the, of industrialization the things come from. And you know, there's so much effort, emphasis put on transportation, on cars and trucks and planes, but they're not the biggest thing. Agriculture, forestry, other land use is actually the biggest, along with electricity and heat production. Those two are the biggest, and together they're almost uh, 50%. Industry, all types of industry are huge. Buildings, you know, we're always yelling, uh, turn the lights off, you know, don't leave the refrigerator door open, all that kind of stuff. You're going to heat the, the house or cool the house and all this. It really doesn't have that much effect. It's important. Uh, every, every little bit has, has some effect, but we really need to concentrate on the agricultural, forestry, and other land use. You know, if we were all vegan, we'd save a lot of energy because we wouldn't need these uh, cows and and pigs and horses. I'm not about to be vegan. I'm not even about to be vegetarian. So, but uh, uh, you know, cows, factory farms, and all that contribute greatly to uh, to uh, global warming. Uh, what we're showing in this diagram is 
where we are today as far as global total global carbon emissions somewhere getting on to around uh, the 9 10 11 or so gigatons per year if we keep going the way we're going that's what the dark color is straight up we're going to get to this higher pathway uh, but if we start to do different things like increase energy efficiency, reducing our emissions and switching to renewable and non-carbon based fuels, we can really lower things quite a bit. So if we did all of those things, we could really reduce the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere and get down, get back down to that 350 uh, parts per million concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But it means having to do a lot of these things. And, and it means we have to start doing them right away. Uh, and, and there's a lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people, a lot of companies, and a lot of governments that are working to do this. There's some ways we can do it. Uh, there's a lot of acronyms and things and a lot of strange ways to do this, but the one on the left here is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. What that means is grow plants, they absorb carbon dioxide. The woody part and the leaves, are, that's carbon dioxide. That's just stored, locked up carbon dioxide. And then you take that and you burn it, but you capture all the carbon dioxide that comes off of that and you sequester it underground. Sequestering carbon dioxide is what making coal and making oil did naturally hundreds of millions of years ago. All those big, all those big swamp forests that ended up being coal fields or these big deposits of organics that ended up being oil fields, what they were doing is taking or, organic material, which the plants growing, uh, the animals growing, was taking carbon dioxide and changing it into biomass. The plants did that, and then the animals eat the plants, and then burying it underground locked it up. So we can remove carbon dioxide that way. Of course, now we come along and we mine the coal and we mine the oil and release that carbon dioxide. But in this thing, the BECCS, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, we try to take some of it and bury it and leave it buried. Uh, another way is this afforestation and reforestation is to, to replant your forest or grow forest in an area where there weren't forests before. That's the af uh, afforestation and re reforestation. Growing them and, and planting them and, and keeping them. Uh, so plant a tree, we all hear that, you know, plant a tree, do plant as many trees as you can, and that will help, every little bit helps. Now, uh, you know, we have a lot of, uh, of for, you see these trucks all the time going by around here filled with these, these logs, the pine logs. You know, a lot of those are, are not just tearing down forests that were, were growing there, uh, they were planted for paper. So, you know, that's kind of a, a, a renewable resource. We shouldn't get mad at people for growing trees uh, and locking up carbon dioxide and then using those trees because those people, the paper companies, are going to plant more trees. So it's going to eventually recycle itself. But just cutting down forests like the Amazon, which is mostly cut down in order to have pasture land for cows. And a lot of for, uh, deforestation has been for that. You're not replanting the forest, you're just tearing it down, burning it for, for fuel or making pasture land. Of course, we shouldn't be too smug in the United States, uh, you know, complaining about Brazil cutting down the Amazon forest when we did the exact same thing when the Europeans uh, colonized uh, North America, because there were great forests over here and we destroyed 90% of them or however much. So there's a lot of uh, the grasslands in the United States and Canada that used to be forested before humans, uh, with our technology, the European uh, migration happened. 
some other things we can do is we can do some adaptation uh, for climate change. Now, this is not really going to change the amount of carbon dioxide, but we're going to have to uh, do something to adapt to these differences in climate and, and weather systems that are going to occur. We can have new kinds of uh, infrastructure, new kinds of uh, evapor of uh, of uh, drainage systems and flood control systems and what have you, new kinds of crops. So we can adapt in that kind of way, or we can also, I love all this terminology that they use in these things now, this transformational adaptation where we change our lifestyles, change the types of crops or the way we, we farm. You know, uh, the University of Georgia, the Agricultural Extension Service, has done tremendous amount of in, in, uh, research on what's called no-till farming. And that means instead of plowing your fields and disking them up and planting your corn or soybeans or whatever new, you don't plow and you just plant new stuff within the, the crap that was left over from the year before. So you don't disturb the surface. You know, you disturb the surface, you know, you expose organics to decomposition, which uses oxygen and releases carbon dioxide. And you also increase the exposure of the soil uh, and, and increase the potential for erosion and losing of topsoil. And the no-till uh, uh, farming ends up being pretty good. And I, and I saw in a column, Walter Reeves, you know, the Southern gardener some years ago, I had a column. There's some woman that he's dealt with for decades and decades who said she, she's never pulled the weed in her garden and has tremendous, she just leaves all the weeds and plants things in there because um, she, she keeps pulling weeds and more are gonna grow. That's not really, global warming related so much, but uh, it's just on a bigger scale, you keep from disturbing the land and you do lock up uh, some carbon dioxide in there. So there, there's a lot of those kinds of, those are the, the, the adaptive measures. And here's the, some of the big geoengineering things we can do. This is called direct air capture. There's a company called Carbon Engineering They've developed a way, they pass, these are big fans in these things, and they just suck in air, pass it through this filter, and it grabs carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They keep the carbon dioxide, compress it, and in some places have actually sold the carbon dioxide to Coca-Cola to use to carbonate the soda. And there's more and more of this going on. In some places like Iceland, they have uh, captured carbon dioxide like this and pumped it down into fractured rock. Uh, they have a lot of fractured rock in the, the, all the volcanic area and they sequester the carbon dioxide in there. Uh, this actually works, except you need a lot more than just one of these things. It, it turns out the estimate is that you'd need to build one thing this size every day for the next 70 years in order to have an impact. And there's only like something like 17 of these things in existence right now, but, but it's something in the future that can actually work. There's also this thing, uh, the, the, the previous thing that's taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. This, these techniques here that have been researched and, and prototypes done are not ways to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide, but actually ways to cool Earth's surface by blocking the sun. And there's a whole bunch of different ways. And these are just some of them. You put aerosol into the atmosphere and sunlight will reflect off of, off of some of it and scatter it, and that kind of like a cloud. There's also potentially the bad things will happen too, because aerosols, you know, can act as uh, nuclei for, for rain to start and you could start getting more rain and do bad things, maybe have more storms, but, but nonetheless, uh, it could block some of the, the rain, uh, some of the solar energy. 
brightening clouds to reflect so incoming solar energy. Uh, James Hansen had what is called his, no, 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 it wasn't him. It was uh, Chu, the former energy secretary under uh, Stephen Chu, was that his name? Uh, energy secretary under Obama. His bright idea, it's called, is to start painting our roof, roofs white. Don't put dark colored shingles on all our houses, put white shingles on it to reflect the sunlight. You know how hot it gets up on, the sun, on our roof. If you did this all over the world, if we had brightly colored, light colored roofs and parking lots and all these other things, of course, tar that we use to build all this stuff is naturally black. So there's an engineering problem there, but we could reflect a lot of solar energy, just reflect it back into space. Even put giant mirrors up in the outer space to reflect sunlight. Uh, put shades up there to reflect some of the sunlight. Now, these are, are huge things. Uh, there are even been studies of putting giant vacuum cleaners up into the atmosphere and sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, there's a lot of engineering that needs to work out, but it can be done. Things can be done. So things are horrible. We did it and we can fix it, but we've got a long way to go. We've got a lot of work to do but there's a lot of neat information out there. And I urge you to go to these two websites just to, to take a look around. Go to that 350.org. That's Bill McKibben. is the guy who basically invented Earth Day. And uh, or uh, he's the one who wants to, to, to keep uh, carbon dioxide, global atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration at 350 parts per, bill, per million. And this drawdown.org uh, is real things that we can do to help uh, reduce the amount of carbon dioxide and, and global warming. There's real ideas in there that have been reviewed by real scientists and experts and psychologists and all and sociologists and all this thing of things we can do changes we can make in our culture that can really help so I, I encourage you to go to those things and and that's basically all i want to say and i think that's uh i've probably way gone over my time uh any questions yeah yeah <laughs> Hi, Dr. Bush. Hi there, Jay. How you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Thank hey, you. I didn't mean to, to steal your thunder about being a vegan. Hey, you did such a fabulous job, and this whole presentation was great, great, great. But you know where I'm going to go with this, right? Yes, go ahead. I figured. <laughs> <laughs> and you did mention it, so I just want to thank you so much. But I wanted to point out, I am vegan, those of you that don't know. And it's absolutely, you're not punishing yourself. You're improving your health. You're improving the environment. And you're certainly... Uh, living a life that's more compassionate for the animals. But I wanted to point out that, you know, there's um, what 7.7 um, billion people on the earth, approximately. And Dr. Bush has told us that that population is going to continue to expand. Um, and yet every hour, we are slaughtering 8 million animals. Every year, we're slaughtering 70 billion animals. So those animals have to eat, right? And you already talked about the grain problem. Um, and, and so the amount of grain that we're growing, the amount of deforestation that has to take place to uh, create these pastures for grazing, and then the amount of deforestation that has to take place to grow all this food for these animals, we could feed the world and the hungry people with the amount of food that we're feeding animals. So it's really not such a horrible thing to cut back a little bit on the amount of uh, animals that you are consuming. And in so doing, you eat a much healthier diet and you're much better you know, off uh, less heart disease, less type two diabetes, less for certain forms of cancer and on and on. But you, know, you did talk about 24% when you showed that pie chart, it goes towards agriculture, which is far more than the transportation sector, all planes, trains, automobiles combined. And yet we tend to think of the fossil fuels that we're burning. Right. You know, there, not to mention all the fertilizer and the nitrous oxide and, 
and manure and all of that other that is also creating far more potent greenhouse gases than, um, than you know, the CO2. And of course, I could go on and on about water usage. 70% of all water goes towards you know, the, the agriculture and, right. and so on. So you know, what can we individually do? Yes, we can drive more uh, energy efficient cars and turn off lights and all of that, but we can also eat fewer animals. And in so doing, you know, you're, you're helping the environment as well in this climate yeah. crisis. You know, I had to say it, Dr. Yeah, of course, yeah, I, I agree. I, anybody else? Yeah, hi there. I think oh, well, I think I'm unmuted now. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, Hey, that was a wonderful presentation. And I've been so bored looking at PowerPoint slides, but you really nailed it. So that was great. <laughs> Thank um, you. I have um, two, two thoughts. Uh, could, that, because the two things that you mentioned, you brought up the, 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 the technological fix for it all. Yeah. And, and right away you mentioned because we're so smart. Well, we could have a technological fix because we're not so smart. <laughs> and, and that has to do with all the, the wars that you were talking about. We're going to have more war. I wouldn't a few, um, what should we say, nuclear explosions um, do a lot to cool the earth? <laughs> it's very interesting. I mean, you can relate, uh, say, a nuclear explosion, a big enough one, to what might happen during a major volcanic eruption. You know, the whole idea of the nuclear winter thing you're putting so much ash and debris up into the atmosphere that you're gonna block the sun. And that's, of course, it happens with volcanic eruptions. Uh, there, that, that's, a, that's a way to do it, it happens naturally. But yeah, I mean, people have said that, you know, if it gets to a point, let's blow everything up and, and uh, but I don't know the answer no. to that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I'm not recommending it as. A, no, I no, just think, no. can we really go a hundred years without blowing each other up? I, I mean, come on, that's asking yeah. for a lot. We're I can't drinking. see it either. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm surprised we've gone this long without blowing each other up. It would be interesting. Though. I'd love to see what an experiment that would be if we had a, a you know a real global war to see how what kind of cooling we would have afterwards. Yeah, the other thing I was thinking of. Um, has to do with the forest because mm -hmm. I live surrounded by trees and I love the trees. And, um, but, but lately I've been directed to, to other forests that I don't see. And it's called like the forest that's in the oceans. Yeah. All that aquatic plant life that's down there. Right. And so what's happening, what, what's happening down there with that life? Well, the, part of the, one of the things is that ocean acidification problem that there, there are a lot of plants that are just regular plants, but a lot, a lot of the single cell plants do secrete a calcium carbonate shell. They're microscopic little things. They have a shell that you know, is made out of uh, calcite, limestone. And those shells are getting thinner and thinner because of ocean acidification, which means the, it, it's making it harder for those uh, single cell plants to, to live uh, robustly. It reduces the lifespan. It, it uh, uh, makes it harder for them to, uh, to uh, photosynthesize. And, and we got a big problem there because I said 50% of at least of the oxygen coming uh, into our atmosphere is from these single cell plants and animals. And then you have uh, the negative impact, uh, of course, of the of, of those plants on the whole food chain. You know, the the animals that eat the plants and the animals that eat the animals, and on and on and on. And then also, uh, Jackie mentioned the, uh, uh, the fertilizer and, and things like that put on on the land, on golf courses, as well as as uh, farming but a lot of that fertilizer runs off of the land and into the rivers and out to the ocean and causes algal blooms now uh, sounds sounds good you put uh, 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 these nutrients out into the ocean and it causes 
more growth. So you think that's a good thing because you get more growth of plants and you get more oxygen. But of course, it backfires on you because the more things that grow, then the more die just naturally. And then they decompose and use up the oxygen in the water. And finally, you end up with these big, what are called the dead zones in, in the ocean. And nothing can live there because there's, there's no oxygen. No animals can live there. And things that do live in there die, decompose. And often there are a lot of things that live out there that are toxic when they decompose. And so you end up with poisons and anoxic zones. A lot of those increasing uh, because of the uh, runoff of nutrients from, from uh, fertilizers. So you have that kind of problem as well. And, and then just other pollution too, impacting nearshore grass beds, whether algal beds, whether they're the shallow water grasses like you get in, in, the, in the off Florida or in the, the Caribbean or, or the kelp beds in, in colder area off the familiar from California and, and the West Coast and uh, the kelp, you know, are like their forests. So they're like the Amazon forest of the ocean, you know, big, long, huge algal uh, uh, trees, essentially, but they're floating in there. Uh, we're, 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 we're killing ourselves. We're doing terrible things. And it's almost beyond repair. But hopefully, we, we got to do a lot of things. Hopefully, we can really make some changes. We have to do a lot of changes. But all of these things are, are things we have to do, not just any one. Pick a favorite one and, and go do it. Thank you. Is uh, anybody out there glad to answer anything? It's a, it's a tremendous topic. If you do get a chance, visit the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change website. Keep an eye out for the new report coming out, I think this year. Uh, the, the one that talks about all of the main stuff I've been talking about today, I think that's due this year. And I say they have several reports for projections and summaries and, and what have you. Well, and, Dr. Bush, we certainly appreciate your being with us this evening. Yeah, glad to do it. And I know I've learned a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Are there no further questions? Yeah. Well, then we thank everybody for being here this evening. Thanks. I'll see you next crisis. Okay. I'll see you. Went from fracking last time to uh, was that fracking? Was that you guys? Yes. I knew I gave a talk on fracking uh, somewhere. Uh, so it's good to see you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.